obviously we had the uh, Badger Dale hack, right? And some other firms, uh, I believe Celsius Network, right? Also has some type of allocation on that network at the time. And so can you explain what happened there? What essentially happened was Badger DAO, like most DeFi apps, has a, a front end, you know, an HTML, JavaScript, web app that your browser is going to download, and then you're going to, you know, click buttons, and it's going to issue some transactions from that. So what happened was a hacker was able to swap out the front end with one that crafted malicious transactions. And specifically what it did is it asked users to approve transactions for the hacker. So if you've ever used an, uh, an app on Ethereum, you'll often have to approve these tr transfers before you actually do something. And basically what that means is you're whitelisting some application to move funds on your behalf so that when you click deposit into BadgerDAO, the BadgerDAO contracts can actually move your funds from your wallet into BadgerDAO. So what happened here was that the attacker replaced all the buttons with buttons that would approve an infinite amount of tokens for the hacker. And then the hacker could just go in and start transferring your tokens, you know, as soon as they saw that approval go out. Um, there were users that alerted the, the developers in their Discord, actually, when this was happening, where they said something like, why, why is the app asking me to approve these tokens? I already did an approval, you know, months ago. Uh, and somebody in the Discord from the team was just like, you know, it's not a big deal. Probably just, you know, <laughs> just an issue on your side or whatever. Um, but of course, it was the malicious front end actually getting the approvals. So it, it, in total, I think about 120 million uh, has been discovered so far to be stolen in this attack. And it was reported that Celsius lost 54 million of that 120 million. What's really interesting about that is Celsius, it, it, you know, did not make it aware to their users that they were putting money in Badger Dow. If you go to the Celsius front page, it's just kind of like, yeah, we'll give you this 6% APY and, you know, we're doing some stuff, some cool stuff with it. Trust us, you know? So if the users knew that it was just going into Badger Dow or something like that, it might've been a different story, but they were sort of just putting, you know, it kind of looks like they're just putting money wherever, wherever there's yields in DeFi and, and spreading it all out everywhere. And so they're going to, they're probably gonna have to eat this loss. Um, but it sort of raises the question of what happens to Celsius if they have a big enough hack, you know, if Celsius lost half of its value in a, a major DeFi hack, would they, you know, have insurance on that? I, I doubt it. I think if this is just a case where they've probably just spread their money out to enough different protocols that this hack is not going to materially impact their bottom line and they're going to be able to reimburse users, but it's certainly could have gone the other way. And there's really no um, line in the sand that, that is stopping this. The other interesting thing about this is that means that whoever, you know, whatever intern or whatever is doing these DeFi transactions for Celsius uh, went to the hacker's front end and clicked the buttons and clicked approve. So this person that's then, and I say intern because it, it seems like this person was not very well versed in security best practices when they're managing potentially hundreds of millions or, or even billions of dollars in crypto. They had some approve pop up on their screen in MetaMask and they're like, yeah, whatever, I'll just approve it. You know, they're just so used to clicking yes on all the approvals. They just went ahead and did another one. And it turns out this one was the bad one. So this really highlights the need for better security practices in DeFi, specifically around knowledge of what these transactions are doing. You know, we're so used to, if, if anyone has a, a Ledger Nano wallet, it's got this little screen. And for the most part, you can't really tell what it is you're signing. You know, you'll, you'll click on some button on a DeFi app and then it'll come up on your ledger. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. But do what? You don't, you don't really know what actually is happening. You just hope that the front end that you're using is not crafting malicious transactions. So there are wallets that are starting to address this that do show you more information about what the transaction is doing. I personally use one called the Grid Plus Lattice, which you can basically load up um, contract ABIs in there so that it knows what you are actually doing when you send it a transaction. And it'll show you the function and the smart contract information for this transaction and the, the addresses. You can have saved addresses so you know that you know it's something you've used before. 
And that's really the only way that you're going to be able to catch these types of front end attacks uh, before they happen and before you approve, you know, a hacker to <laughs> steal all your money. Now, one thing I believe you could do correct is when you go to make the approval, you copy the other contract address and maybe go check it on Etherscan, correct? To make sure you're interacting with BadgerDAO. Yes. Yeah. So you can, you can check when you approve a token, you can see the address that you're approving it for. And then, so you'd want to, you'd want to go look and, and see that this matches a contract for BadgerDAO. But the issue is, is it, it's somewhat complicated for users to do this because you kind of have to snoop around Etherscan. And, and sometimes a DeFi app is made up of multiple contracts. And so you have to go kind of see, oh, this is BadgerDAO proxy contract. This is BadgerDAO governance contract, you know, and you got to figure out which one is actually supposed to transfer tokens and then, and then match that address up. Um, so it's not, it's not as straightforward as, you know, looking at one page and figuring it out. You have to do some snooping. And if you're somebody at Celsius managing hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah, you should, you should be able to do that. But for the average user, this is not something we, we should ask people to do. We should have better systems in place that, that prevent this sort of thing. So where do you see that coming in the future? Is that going to be something through like the uh, uh, MetaMask integration and they're resolving that? Or ultimately, if the user's just going in and kind of clicking buttons, where does that need to happen? Yeah, the wallets definitely play a huge role in there. Um, so, so the wallets do need to show you some information about what these transactions are doing. MetaMask does a good job these days of, of showing you that information. Um, I, I also really like uh, Phantom Wallet on Solana. They show you good information, including um, balance changes. So like when you're depositing something, you know, into a money market on, on Solana, the Phantom Wallet will show you, well, your, your balance is going to go down by this much USDC. And then you think, okay, does this check out? Is, am, I, am I depositing USDC? And if so, then, you know, that balance change makes sense. So just showing some consequences of the transaction can be very helpful as well. And I think we're going to see more of that. Just, just basically, we'll get to a point where every, every transaction you do, you'll be able to see a bunch of details and, and consequences of, of what happens from this transaction. And then the second part of that is we need the hardware wallets to display that info as well. Because if your computer is hacked, the hacker can show you whatever he wants. You know, he can show you on your screen, yeah, this transaction is doing something benign. But then when you actually go to sign the transaction on your hardware wallet, a separate device, it's going to show you what's really going on. And so that's where you need that, that second factor uh, of extra security so that they can't just, you know, hack your computer and steal everything by getting you to, to sign something malicious. I guess two things unpack here too is also obviously, you know, with Celsius having that loss, right? I mean, this kind of just uh, on the surface without going into details on the regulations, but, you know, they kind of take in uh, crypto assets, pay out a preferred return, and ultimately could have the uh, user's capital at risk is kind of looks like what would be a security across the board, right? Um, so it'll be interesting as some of these states come to a conclusion of how this is going to look or how this is being offered. Cause I mean, most, well, I don't say most, a good portion of the users is definitely unaccredited. Right. And so <laughs> it'll yeah. be, it'll be interesting. I think 2022, hopefully will be the year of some clarity around some of that stuff of the offerings. Right. I, I hope it is. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly Celsius is in the, the targets of, of the regulators, um, you know, whether, whether them or BlockFi or one of these other big ones, um, you know, gets hit with a lawsuit first, probably one of them is going to get hit and it's going to force a change in the way that these businesses operate, whether it is just only offering to accredited investors or if it's, you know, uh, forcing to have more transparency in the product. We'll, we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, I don't have much faith in the regulators to do the right thing. So I, I think that for, for the most part, uh, the, the Celsius and, and the BlockFi business model are just going to be eaten by the pure decentralized alternatives like, like Wiren, you know, on, on the Ethereum network where it does basically the same thing, but in a fully decentralized way that cannot just be shut down by the regulator's whim. And uh, e even if it is, you know, risky for users and whatnot, it does have full transparency on the blockchain to tell you what it is it's doing with your money. You can go look and, and every single, you know, dollar or ether you put into Wiren, you can trace that on the blockchain and see where, it, where it's ending up and, and what risks are there. So that is a lot different from Celsius where the users probably had no idea that they were invested in, in BadgerDAO. Oh, of course, no one has no, no one has any idea what the full, <laughs> the full balance sheet looks like right there, besides maybe right. the guys who just got in the last financing round. Yeah, exactly.
And so what do you think this uh, ultimately ends up for Badger Dow? How, what happens maybe from here? Well, in, the, in this bull market, DeFi protocols have been pretty resilient to hacks where it's, it sort of in a way becomes an opportunity to restructure the team and, and re-inject capital and for investors to sweep in and, and buy the token at a discount. Um, so I think for the most part, Badger Dow will, will come out okay. And they'll probably find a way eventually to pay back the money to the users. It may take a while. It may take a couple of years. You know, it may may require them to mint tokens and and hope hope that the market value eventually settles it out. But I think uh, at this point, it's it's going to be absorbable by the market. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. You know, we should we shouldn't <laughs> rely on that as sort of our insurance. Um, and, and mentioning insurance, there was actually an interesting uh, event with Nexus Mutual where Badger DAO users were actually denied coverage because this was a hack of the front end. And a lot of people on Twitter were saying, well, what's even the point of decentralized insurance if you, know, you can't cover this type of hack? And it is an interesting point because it's, it's difficult to cover hacks of front ends. The reason why is because a front end by nature runs the code on a user's computer rather than in a blockchain. So if you downloaded a virus and then, you know, you go to some DeFi front end and you run it, that virus could change the code and, you know, inject malicious code to steal your money or something like this Badger DAO hack. And so Nexus Mutual, there's no way for them to like audit your computer, right? They can, they can audit the smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. They can, they can audit that solidity code and say, yeah, we, we don't see any bugs. You know, we're willing to, to put up this capital behind it. But they have no idea who the end users you know, are or what they're doing with their computers. And so fundamentally, they're not really able to ensure against a front end kind, kind of attack. And I think this is going to be a difficult thing for the insurance industry to cover um, and, I, and I think probably there will be a lot more emphasis on secure front ends and, and hosting these front ends securely, as opposed to relying on insurance to, to mitigate that. I mean, that's definitely uh, some feedback I had from some other people is that two parts that you can't really count on the insurance. One, it's kind of voted on whether they're going to pay out certain claims. And then the other aspect is, I don't think it's so clear for users to understand where they would be covered exactly. And for some that may not be as tech savvy, they just probably assume, hey, if something happens, I'm being covered. And like all insurance policies, it's all that fine print that basically uh, helps the insurance company from paying out. I mean, what's your take on Nexus and really how they're set up and if they're doing the proper thing? Yeah, it's definitely a problem for Nexus in, in their you know market adoption to communicate this to users and, and for users to understand um, what they're actually buying when they buy this insurance. Because yeah, the, the average user barely understands the difference between a, a front end and a back end, you know, or, 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 the, or, or why this hack could not be covered. So Nexus really has an uphill battle to fight there and, and the other insurance platforms as well in, in educating users on this and getting them to understand the value that they're providing and, you know, that it's still worth it in most cases to insure against a, a smart contract hack. Um, Certainly institutions are going to be more aware of this and are more likely to be major buyers of insurance. On the user end, we're probably going to have to get to the point where insurance is just bundled in to the products. And by nature of using it, you know, you just click buy this thing or you click invest and it's just going to buy insurance on the back end for you. And so you don't even think about it. It's just included in the price. And, and then you're not complaining, you know, when the front end gets hacked because you didn't even know you're really buying insurance to begin with. So that, that's sort of the way I think the industry is going to have to go to just try to cover what it can for users automatically. And, uh, you know, th that, that will basically settle th these issues of, of users thinking they, they bought insurance or whatever. And if they want insurance against their own computer getting hacked, 